If you're trying to make real money online, you need to stop with Amazon FBA. Peace, peace, greetings to you all. It's your brother Naheem, BKA Lord Abba, AKA Mr. Just the Facts. Um, family, we have a powerful, powerful interview tonight. Uh, we got the author of the book that we've been harping on for the past couple of weeks, The Devil You Know. Um, he, he's in the building tonight, family. Uh, make sure you hit that like button. If you are new to the channel, make sure you hit the subscribe icon. Right next to it, there's a little bell icon. Make sure you click on that so you can become a part of the Notification Nation. If you would like to contribute to the platform, use the Cash App handle, be the power. You can become a monthly member via Patreon. Also, you can use that Super Chat family. Y'all already know we are trying to grow BTP into our own TYT. So, um, you know, tonight we got our our brother Josh, BTP Josh, and our uh, proxy BTP. <laughs> I, I'm gonna call her our our proxy BTP guest. I don't I don't really like to call drop her shipping. She's, she's Shopify. One of the family. Feel our sister Cynthia <laughs> on with us I, tonight. I'm call, um, give everybody a, a quick shout out, fam. Peace, family. Thank you for tuning in. Definitely. So um, today, family, we are joined by, by Charles Blow, the critically acclaimed journalist and op-ed columnist for the New York Times, who makes frequent appearances on CNN. He is the author of the New York Times best-selling memoir, Fire Shut Up In My Bones, that currently resides in Atlanta. Brother Charles Blow, welcome to Be The Power. Thank you for having me. Um, man, let's 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 get into this. We have been on on this book for a while now since its release. I've seen an interview that you were doing scrolling through my usual YouTube feed. Um, I'm familiar with with you as a writer from the New York Times, so you know I usually scroll past a lot of stuff, but I, something just told me to click on this video, and and I did, and. I'm so glad that I did. I got the book right away. We are trying to resurrect the spirit of the freedmen in, in the United States of America. We feel that the more we've gotten away from that language of reconstruction, the more watered down African-American politics has become. So, you know, I, we feel that this book was just right on time with what we are trying to do politically and, and with our people and this strategy of political power. I mean, it, it couldn't be ignored. Uh, first, let me just say, this was a, a powerful and, and very well written book. So- Thank you so much. Oh man, you're welcome, honors, honors. So my, my first question is, um, and we're gonna just go in, in order, brother Josh is gonna come in, ask sister Cynthia, come in, we just gonna ask some questions and get into this thing. My, my first question, uh, on page 55, you speak of this particular strategy not being along the, the party line, the Democratic Party to be exact, not a liberal or a progressive strategy, although I personally feel that it is a progressive strategy, not progressive in the ideology since that we have progressivism today, I feel it is progressive for our people. How do you reconcile that with people's notions that you are presenting this idea as one that will solely benefit the Democratic Party? Because I'm hearing that in, in a lot of the feedback we've gotten on from the book club and in Twitter discussions. Um, thanks for the question. I mean, I think it's important to both uh, well, first to say that when I say black power, I don't mean political party power. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean black people's ability to influence the political power structure of the party. 
Uh, and as such, uh, I, but I also understand the voting patterns that Black people have today. That voting pattern that exists today, uh, if Black people gain more political power and continue that same strategy and the parties to the same positioning would now benefit Democrats. But I am reminded that, you know, political parties change. In fact, Democrats positions on racial issues and Republicans literally flipped into opposite positions. The Democratic Party was hand down the party of the racist and the Klan. <laughs> Uh, and right. the Republican Party was hands down the party of of, uh, of uh, emancipation uh, uh, and who for for the, the aims of Reconstruction. And yet, uh, they there was realignment over the course of a hundred years, and Black people are savvy enough to be able to say, "I know your past, and it's horrible, Democrats, but right now." You're the best thing I have, and that's how they vote. Mm. And the people who right now are courting the racist can't uh, buy that vote. You know, literally, they're trying or try to suppress it because until you get do uh, abandon that strategy, there's nothing to be done here. However, pushing black power as I see it, where you actually put, you are able to deliver states in a presidential election, where you're ab actually ever uh, able to deliver a block of US senators, where you have enough power in the Senate that you can block the judicial and, and uh, Supreme Court justice nominees, then you become a player in a different way. Mm -hmm. And you're mm -hmm. able to put pressure on everybody to respond to your policy needs. Right now, Black people are what social scientists call a captured constituency in the Democratic Party because you, you only have one other option and they are off limits because they're courting these races. That's right. Then right. you have, you, you, you know, some of the vote is genuine enthusiasm and some of it is hostage vote. Mm. I don't have a choice. I don't have a choice because I can't vote for that guy and, you know, you are closer to me than that person, so I'm going to vote here. The problem is that with capture constituents is you rarely get your policy objectives accomplished because they are not prioritized. Mm -hmm. The priority goes to the group of people who are more fickle, the ones who might fall away. Uh, and, and if you want any uh, real example of that, there's no greater, better example than what happened after Hillary Clinton's loss in 2016. There were fewer black people, black percentages who showed up to vote. But instead of coming out of that and saying, we well, normally get 80, whatever, 90, whatever percent, we got closer to 80, top to the high 80 percent, we need to figure out how to get them back. We spent two years talking about white people, uh, economic anxiety in the Middle West. How, what happened to them? How do we get them back? What, and crafting policy around them. In fact, when Joe Biden began his run for president, he, that was his, um, you know, uh, his motto, basically that he was the person who could win back the working class white That's guys. Right. And right. so that meant that, you know, what they were doing is calling you in when white people basically split down the middle in mm -hmm. Michigan and Pennsylvania and in, and in Philadelphia. Not because you were it, it was that you were the tiebreaker. That's right. Right, and so you, that is, that's not what real power resides. What real power resides and the way you know it's real power is what has happened here in Georgia is what happened in the election in Georgia, where black people became the majority of the coalition for the first time in, the, uh, I don't know reconstruction numbers because it's just very few numbers, but at least since reconstruction, that black people delivered a state for any presidential candidate yes. were the majority of that coalition. And it was the first time in the entire history of the Senate that black people were the majority of a coalition that delivered a Senate seat, and they didn't just deliver one, they delivered two. Right. And that is why you see such a, a, a strong reaction in the Georgia State House to try to clamp down on that. It's not just that they went Democratic, it is that Black people did it. Mm. Yep. yep, that's right. Brother Josh. Brother Josh. 
Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. I mean, we. I just want to let the brother know we have like a hundred questions a piece. <laughs> <laughs> so, because we, <laughs> we we do this on on our platform, we we talk politics. We try to reach sure. the streets, and so we we try to get the best questions that we possibly could in this time. And again, I appreciate you for coming on. Go ahead, Brother Josh. Absolutely. Yeah, I wanted to ask about, um, first, I got to say props, the book. I, I very much enjoyed it. Um, I think it's a powerful um, piece for us to educate the people with. And, and it presents the idea that I think um, not a lot of people thought about to consider as a way to get power. But when we explain it and when we um, talk about it from the reference of your family history in your, your in your you know your bloodline your family story it's a way that I think people can connect with um, so I just want to say thank you for writing this book um, you I appreciated how you talked about the push and the pull factor that's a very simple concept to understand in terms of the pull the push factors the factors that cause the great migration or what we call the great escape and the factors that um, you know, attracted people to uh, want to go to the you know, specific destination cities or areas. And then now we have, when we want to do that in reverse, we have, we, you identify the push and pull factors um, that, that are driving us down, uh, that would drive people back to the South. And we are, we're already seeing that now. Uh, but, you know, from a pull factor, uh, what are some of the other pull factors that you, that you consider? So uh, the primary uh, pull factor for most voluntary migrations in America have been economic. Uh, that is the Dust Bowl right, migration, that, uh, that is um, the Gold Rush migration, that is the uh, great migration of Black people to the North. Uh, uh, but there have also been pull for, uh, migrations where the primary pull factor was more freedom. And that is not exclusive from migrant migration, because migrant migration pull factor was both economic and political and, and cultural freedom. Uh, but there are other ones, like uh, one that I use as an example, I think probably helped me to um, write this book, is... Uh, was the what what young white hippies did in um, Vermont. Vermont. Vermont, you know. So in, in 1972 or so, the hippies were protesting all sorts of ways, including sometimes violent ways against President Nixon's execution of the Vietnam War. But he Nixon kept going the way he wanted to go and didn't pay him much mind. Uh, and these two law students wrote in the Yale Law Review that, you know, you can't have a revolution the way you want to have it because they're going to put you down if you try to do it violently and you just can't have it. But one thing you can do is what they call um, uh, radical federalism. You can just take over a state. And uh, that kind of language for a year or so to a, a more prominent writer picks it up right in, in Playboy under the headline, Take Over Vermont. And tens of thousands of these young white hippies, mostly in the Northeast, move to Vermont. Not because they have somewhere to stay, not because their economic conditions, many of them sleep in the fields, they develop communes, whatever they have to do. But they change Vermont over decades from one of the most conservative states in America to now as one of the most liberal states in the union. And produces for Barack Obama his highest percentage of the white vote of any state in 2008. And it produces people like Bernie Sanders. And uh, they basically changed Vermont from New Hampshire into Vermont. And it, and it showed just how easy this was to do. It didn't mean they didn't meet resistance, but it wasn't a bloody revolution. It wasn't an armed revolution. What the, the, the beauty of the Constitution is, uh, is that uh, many of the mechanisms that were used to suppress Black people can be used to liberate you, right? So they, the Constitution uh, uh, allocates half of its power, this is the compromise, half of its power is allocated based on population, but the other half is based on geography. You just need to have your people in the right state 
mm-hmm. and then you get half the power. Right now, there are so like six or seven states where the white population is 90% or more. Now, first of all, no one says, oh, my God, this is a racial problem. That, that can't be. How do we let that happen? <laughs> no one says a word, right? But I say 51% Black people in the state, and everybody says, it's a radical, right. radical <laughs> conversation. No, no, there's literally right now 90% white people. Um, uh, but th- if you take the population of all those states, put them together, they're only one-fourth the population of Black people in this country. Mm-hmm. It's even not. It's not about your scale. People say, "Well, black people can't can't, can't think they're going to have that much power to own a fourteen percent of the population." Scale has nothing to do with it. That's right. Those people in those six or seven states represent only three percent of the American population, but they also represent one out of every six Senate votes ever cast on any issue. Wow. wow. What you have to do is decide if you want to be strategically arrayed in America rather than completely spread out. And there's a balkanization of this country that's coming rather than whether I wrote this book or not, it's happening. In 30 years from now, you know, six, seven, eight of the Southwestern states will be majority Hispanic, not majority brown, not majority minority, majority Hispanic. They will send whatever delegation they want to Washington and they should. They will control all those electoral college votes, and then that's the way it breaks. Uh, Hawaii will continue to be majority Asian, South Pacific Islander, and they will send the people representing that demographic to the, to Congress as they do now. Uh, Oregon, Washington, down into the Rockies will continue to be majority white. Everything east of that will be some combination of majority white and majority minority. There is not a single state on that map 30 years from now that it's projected to be majority black. Mm. Now, black people just have a choice to make. I, I, as I've been going in this book, so I keep saying, I'm not twisting you on. I'm saying, do you want uh, state power or, do, or not? That's right. Because you can have it. It has nothing to do with your scale. It has nothing to do with, you know, you being 14% of the population. It has to be do it. Where do you want to be, literally position yourself in the country? Because you can have that power, and you're you're gonna move. And and, I, and my feeling about it is that the window on you being able to even do this is closing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Also, thirty years from now, will be the first time that Asians will outnumber Black people. Mm. Wow. Okay. And also that at that point, there will be nearly twice as many Hispanics in America as Black people. Mm. Mm. In, something, in something like 50 or 60 years, you will have gone from being the, the first minority in America to the third. Mm. And how mm. do you think that you're, and, and also will not control a single state. That's right. And can't deliver it for a presidential candidate on your own. How do you then think that your priorities are going to stack up against the other two larger minority groups, two of whom can deliver states in a presidential election? Mm-hmm. Ooh. Mm. <laughs> that hey, is sobering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it's real, that which is one of the reasons why we pounced on this thing, because we've been trying to come up with the strategy to harness our political power. And I mean, you you are right on time with this book, brother. Uh, Sister Cynthia. Thank you. Um, first off, Mr. Blow, I, I want to say that I enjoyed reading your book. Uh, it was very well yeah. written. I echo the sentiments of my brothers on the platform. And I got a couple of questions and I think I'm gonna sure. take it in a different realm because I am from Chicago and mm-hmm. 
or I appreciated how you opened up your book with, you know, talking about Hyde Park, which is really <laughs> down the street around the corner from my crib. <laughs> and also, hey, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. We got this Chicago, New York thing going on <laughs> on our platform. So I think that was just a little, little big in there, but I'm going to be quiet. Go ahead, Sister Cynthia. You know, Brother Naheem, I said nothing about pizza. Anyway, so. <laughs> um, but I, I know that you um, opened your book actually speaking with uh, Timuel Black. And, you know, a yeah. uh, 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 very well-known historian, civil rights activist, and, you know, current, you know, resider of the uh, South Side of Chicago. I remember you even mentioned that, um, I believe his assistant offers you a drink and you decline. I was about to say, what did they offer you that you declined to drink? So, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, no, it, was, it was his wife. And she, I don't know if she offered me something, but I was like in reporter mode and I just... Yeah. <laughs> understandable <laughs> understandable i'm personally trying not to drink coffee right now but uh <laughs> but uh one of the questions that i wanted to ask you was specifically uh concerning the uh propaganda or the marketing behind the great migration um and also about the role of the uh chicago defender uh, i mentioned you mentioned in your book about how uh the chicago defender uh was very much so a pull, you know, no pun intended, to bringing, you know, African Americans from the South to the North in destination cities like the one that I live in right now. So can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit more, talk a little bit more about that, uh, you know, how the role of the uh, Chicago Defender played in that? And do you think that it was a help or a hindrance to our people? Uh, so yes. Uh... One of the interesting things about the Great Migration is that it did have a PR effort on many fronts. Um, there was the recruiters from Northern industry who came down. The North was quickly uh, being an, an industrialized. And uh, at that moment, many of the Northern white young men had gone away to fight in World War One. So you have this incredible deficit, the big factories, but no one in them, and they can't find anybody. And they're like, we'll take those black people from the South. So they literally send agents to the South with pamphlets whenever they can give them out. Many Southern cities and some states outlaw these agents because they don't, they don't want black people to have any power, but they want them as a cheap labor force. Mm. Uh, so they don't want them to move. They, don't, they want them to shut up. Uh, and at the same time, you know, at, at, so part of the push is, you know, uh, there's this pull. All of a sudden, someone says, oh, I have better jobs up here. Black people have lived in the South for 60 years following the end of the Civil War, living through all of this white terror, living through all of the oppression, and they still didn't move. In fact, during slavery, most free black, there were more free blacks living in the South than in the North. Even the during slavery, black people who were free didn't leave the South. Mm. South was home. And but when they had this extra wrinkle, which was my job has collapsed with these this bold weasel infestation of the cotton crop. And there's a guy saying there's a great job of north for me and i can get away from all this lynching and terror people jumped on it seeing this happen abbott who is the publisher for the chicago defender also a southerner who has moved to to the north takes full advantage of it and becomes one of its biggest cheerleaders and the the uh, he in some cases they would publish on one page amazing story of success of somebody moving north and literally on the facing page would be a lynching of somewhere in the south oh wow and there was oh, a juxtaposition wow. this is going to be good for you look at where you are it's bad and the, the on the trains they would sneak these papers back into the south and that became a herald to more people wanting to move in addition as people moved they sent word back to other people. I moved. I made it. It's not. It's not as bad as you want. It's cold, but you know we're we're free. And they're not harassing us, and there's no lynching. And all of that became the PR. 
the Urban League, which was a very young organization at the time, stepped in and made part of its mission to help these young migrants to blend in. A lot of these people were coming, but they'd never been on a sidewalk. They'd never seen a sidewalk. These were farmers. Uh, and they would, they would, I mean, one of the pamphlets I saw, just don't spit on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're reading a black newspaper, put it inside one of the white newspapers so they won't see it. You know, it's like all this little, just how you make it kind of a thing. And so, uh, of course, you know, he becomes an amazing voice for the great migration. There are detractors. Before Frederick Douglass died, he was adamantly opposed mm. to migration out of the South. When the Exeters did it, and they just moved to Kansas, they didn't move way north, he was adamantly opposed that they should move. He believed in the philosophy that I'm uh, uh, discussing now, which is that in concentration of your power, you can control a region. And the moment you start to dilute your power there, you lose control. But, you know, Abbott uh, does his thing, and people listen, and the momentum oh. starts to build. Uh, now you're seeing a reverse migration, but it doesn't have the same PR, same advocates. It's, it's just not, it's, it's like people are just doing it big on their own. It's very organic, and no one is cheerleading. I had a discussion last night with uh, uh, over 12 Black mayors of southern cities to discuss this very thing why are you guys not making this easier for these millennials who are moving south? like why first of all why why is there no advertising about well where's no welcome home billboard on mm. the sidewalk on the, on the freeway why is there no program no nothing yeah that's what i was trying to allude to in my first question that's, that's exactly what i'm i was trying to uh, figure out like what are these people in these states doing to actually add something to the pool because you you highlighted the factors that it's, like you said it's happening organically but like they could be bringing in more people and wouldn't that be advantageous for them in terms of power absolutely absolutely there's a growing number of black cities in america and our 1200 majority black cities and towns in the united states 90 percent of them are the in the american south that's right uh, 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 Maynard Jackson becomes the mayor of Atlanta, making him the first mayor of a major southern city in 1973. And that's because Atlanta became a majority black city in 1970 for the first time. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look around the South, this not includes uh, Texas and, and, and uh, Florida, which are highly Hispanic, look around the South, it is hard to find a major city that does not have a black mayor or recently had one. Municipal power of the major cities in the South are now in the hands of Black people and the Black power structure. Hmm. The fact that they are not actively participating in helping to facilitate a transition for these young people who are already moving. You're not even, this is not even saying, please move. They're already doing. In 2014, 82 thousand millennials alone moved migrated back to the south mm. what are you doing to help this help them to land better indeed indeed i mean we're gonna do our part for page 103 i'm we we reparationists over here so we have to speak mm -hmm. <laughs> to to sure. reparations and i i was you know i looked at your comment i was like <sighs> but it, it still made sense. It still made sense, right? So, and the very thing that moved me to get this book is when I heard you speak about controlling those 12 Senate seats in a majority Black South. In that, I then viewed reparations as more of a possibility in the scenario, which, which you also spoke to as well. My, my pushback came from the idea that local reparation initiatives would be more plausible in this scenario, right? A, a repopulated South. Now we, on, on this side, we follow a lot of the, the um, reparationist works from socioeconomists like Dr. William 
Sandy Darity. And he has been on record stating, I believe he just did an article in the Washington Post about a week ago. I think that was about a week ago where, you know, he praised the Evanston, Illinois local reparations initiative, but he spoke to how this is, it, it limits and kind of waters down what needs to be done for us nationally across the board. So my, my question to you is, based on the fact that no state budget would be able to take on this Herculean, Herculean task of, of a reparations program like the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 with the Japanese American. So, you know, how would a local reparations plan help those outside of, because remember, you're calling for 22%. I'm calling for everybody, right? But you're calling for at least half of the people outside of, of the South to come back to the South for political power and, and possibly it'll help with reparations. How, you know, how would that appeal to those outside of these Southern states? Because they would still be living in decadence for the most part. Right. So I, I think the 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 uh, local, state, and national reparations uh, pushes are not mutually exclusive but complementary. Uh, that uh, there are local municipalities that have done harm with just within their local municipality in some uh, massacre or some uh, 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 event that you can single out that needs to be repaired as well. There are whole states, uh, you know, what I did part of this was going through and reading state constitution conventions, all the constitution conventions that were called to basically um, write white supremacy, not basically, they, they say write white supremacy into the constitution. They say it over and over and over, which you know, people think white supremacy, say, us saying white supremacy now, is some kind of new chic thing to say. No, they were saying it a zillion oh, times yeah. in these minutes. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. And so, uh, so there are states that did this on purpose that need and 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 was it, and those states were collecting tax revenues from everybody, but uh, their their outlays of those revenues were highly highly distorted. They they those states in particular have. A, a debt that they owe. And the That's federal government, and for his part, has a separate debt mm. that it owes. I'm saying that every uh, uh, level of government that has a debt should pay their debt. Mm. And the most mm. important thing is to start to get uh, reparations into the hands of people. Mm -hmm. at, every, at any level that you can do it. You know, waiting for the federal government uh, uh, means that, that, you know, every decade that ticks by, that money could have been used to start business. That money could have been used to start business districts. That money could have been used to better schools. That money could have been used to, to improve the facility that HBCU. We need to get money into people's hands now. That's right from whatever source it comes from. That's right, that's right. You just mentioned um, Texas and Florida. And you know, if you look at those states, those states have the second and largest black population um, in America, you know, respectively. And I noticed that when you were talking about um, the movement, like reverse migration, you're talking about um, outside of the South, but you know, Texas and Florida is still the South. And I think collectively they may have something close to uh, or over over almost 8 million black folks in the state. But the projection for us to, like you just mentioned, to get the majority um, in those states is right now, is, is, I mean, even like, there's no way for us to migrate and it wouldn't make sense to do that in those states. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. would it make sense for us to also call for some black folks to move out of Texas and Florida to, to help um, build the numbers up uh, larger so we can get power in, in, in the other states that we have a chance at. Uh, you're absolutely right. Texas and Florida are not on my reverse migration list of target states. 
and anyone any state that is not on that list i'm I, i'm encouraging people to move mm, okay. uh, the same okay. thing uh, uh at the moment for dc mm. number one uh, gentrification has so hollowed that city out of black people. I, there's one quote that we've given to the Washington Post. They say you should call it Chocolate City, not to call it Chocolate Chip City. Hey, Josh because uses that it, quote. It, hey, Josh says right. that on our platform all the time. I say, I say, right. Latte now, City. Now you can call it Latte right, right. City. <laughs> and, and, and so, right. So, uh, but you know, uh, and 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 more importantly to me, at the moment, you don't have center, uh, uh, senators representation and voting representation in Congress. But you could if those people live right across that border in 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 Maryland, mm -hmm. mm. right? Mm. Uh, so yes, I am encouraging all the people who are not on those target lists of the states that I have targeted, all of them, whether they're southern cities or not. There are 15 southern cities. I don't have nine on my list. That's right. Mm -hmm. Arkansas is not on it. Mm -hmm. Tennessee is not on it. West Virginia is not on. It. So there are a lot of places even in the south that I encourage people to move because even during the Great Migration, there was internal Southern migration. Mm -hmm. Many people moved to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. People moved to Texas. Right. Yeah, I did my ancestry and, and I found out that um, um, I have an ancestor that um, my great, great, great grandmother, her people are originally from, her parents are from Virginia, but she was born in eighteen in the eighteen forties in Texas. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's that's not during the Great Migration period, but just to see right. like how people moved to yeah. But Sister Cynthia, I know I don't want to take too much more time. Did you want to ask your question? Uh, yes, I I did have one burning question for you, Mr. Blow. So um, that is that you have gained some criticisms over the years as a New York Times columnist, and, mm -hmm. and you have even uh, acknowledged that in your book. Um, matter of fact, uh, Isaac Chotner of the New Republic wrote in 2013 that Blow's idea of being controversial is to tell New York Times readers that the Tea Party is bad. Now, <laughs> I thought that was funny, but anyway. <laughs> but now with this book, being very mm -hmm. forward with a proposed idea of Blacks moving to the South to gain more political power. How is this different from being accused of basically not being more aggressive in your politics and ideas or your political ideas? Well, I mean, I think that uh, the only thing that you can do to be uh, a, a public voice and be successful at it is to be honest. And that means that no anybody who expects to agree with you 100% of the time, they're always going to be disappointed. And you have to go into uh, kind of a, a being public voice, understand you can't please everybody. Like the moment you start doing that, you've already failed because now you're not true to yourself. You know, there, there's parts of me uh, that are incredibly liberal on some issues. There's parts of me that are a little bit less uh, strategically liberal on those issues. I am the product of where I am from, and that informs a lot of it. I'm from the South. Uh, Southern Black people are highly religious. I'm no, not a religious man myself, but I was when I was a child. Uh, Southern Black people are generally pragmatic and much more conservative than their Northern counterparts. That is part of my upbringing. That is part of who I am. So all you can do in life is just try to be as honest about what you're thinking and how you're feeling and also be open to the possibility that you are wrong and can be corrected. That makes an authentic voice. Uh, and authenticity is, is, is in the end all you have because it is voice. Um, so, you know, in, uh, I write, I've written two books I wrote them because I believed that they had to be written. Hmm. So I just truly believe completely in what I've written about reverse migration. I write columns because it's literally what's on my mind and how I believe that I, how I see things. I don't write it because I'm thinking, oh, this will get a lot of likes and this will get a few, or everybody agree with this and nobody agree with that. That's a formula for failure to me. Or, or even if you succeed, you succeed at being fake. Indeed. So I just so I just say this is it. <laughs> you know, uh, 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 honestly trying to explain how I see the world, and uh, uh, when when you 
agree, thank you. When you don't agree, I understand that because we are humans. But I also, when I'm reading other people's stuff, I try to grant enough grace to say, this is just how they feel. It doesn't make them a bad person. It doesn't make them uh, have evil motivations or trying to, you know, uh, harm the race or something. They just, on this issue, don't agree with my positioning. And that's how I try to navigate it. Oh, definitely, well, definitely. Yeah. Well, I'm, you know, honored to have had you on today. Um, we looked at your, read your book. We looked at the plan. We had similar discussions last year around the same time, ironically, about gaining power in states like Mississippi and Alabama. We, I mean, we had several conversations about that, but we didn't think about <laughs> like reverse migration. So the of the other brothers that are on Be the Be the Power platform, when they read the book, one of our brothers, brother Logic, I mean, you know, he's our political brain out the crew. And he was like, man, this is this is powerful. This is a powerful, powerful strategy. And I from the south side of Chicago. <laughs> oh, okay, Chicago. <laughs> so, um, if, if, if just real quick before you before you go, right? You you touch on that in the book about people in these destination cities, particularly me being from New York City, Sister Cynthia being from Chicago. We place more emphasis on the place than we place on heritage, as done in the South. I've been living in the South now for about 12, 13 years, and I've seen that. I, I've experienced the Southern thing, if, if, for lack of a better word, with my, with my New York-isms, right? And I've been mm -hmm. able to navigate uh, the South using my New York-isms and adopting a lot of the Southern I guess things, I got to keep using that word because I'm struggling to find the proper mm -hmm. term. But, and and I think that it is something that's doable. Uh, I believe that we are those radical voices that Harry Belafonte spoke of that you mentioned in your book in, in critique of Barack Obama. We we have our critiques of Obama as well on Be The Power. Um, and, and, you know, that that's a whole nother discussion. But, you know, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this work. We're, we are going to continue to push this book. We have a reparations rally coming up in Atlanta, Georgia on June 18th at 11 a.m. Uh, we are going to be giving out copies of the book, family. Make, make sure y'all come through to support. In it, we are going to be driving this particular message home to our people in the North. Come back down south. It's time for us to come home. We, we have more power here. We've been, I've been har harassed and experienced more racism in all of my years in New York City than I have so far being in the South for 13 years. That says a lot. That says a whole lot. So again- also, And also it says a lot about powerlessness. The fact that New York City is one of our oldest cities in this country, and it has had one black mayor in the entire right. history of that city, and they, that was 30 years ago, and right. he was followed by two flaming racists. That's right. <laughs> right? Right. Uh, uh, as a backlash to him, the fact that, that they've had only one black police chief. And, and, when, right. when I, and there, there are two million black people in New York City. That's, mm -hmm. Some states don't have too many. That's right. Two million black people there, and you can't, you've never produced a black senator. Mm -hmm. You have one black governor, and that was because the guy who, he was lieutenant governor when the other guy got caught up in a prostitution scam, mm -hmm. right? And then when you went and ran for actual election, you couldn't make it. That's right. 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 So, and, and also New York's gonna be blue whether you're there or not. That's so right. where is your That's power? Right. You're, you're concentrated, never be concentrated in this one place in America and you can't have a black governor and you have no black senators and you have a handful of black congressmen and they're all in and around New York City. And, and if they say they want to have stop and frisk, there is nothing you can do to stop it. That's right. That, so that hurts. That's, That's facts. Right.
Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I could say the same similar thing here in Chicago. I mean, we're a third of the population, but it's all Illinois always goes blue no matter what. And mm -hmm. we have black mayors, but as far as policy is concerned, we, we you know, have been pretty politically active in, in Chicago and did, you know, get some wins, but, you know, it wasn't without a fight. And um, but regardless, we get a lot of pushback, you know, uh, even with police um, and and a lot of the, the same issues that, you know, either Brother Naheem was talking about in New York. So, you know, it, it has me thinking as well. Yeah, hey, real quick, Brother Blow, I was about to move back to New York and do politics up there. It's, everything happens for a reason. I was laying in the bed one night. I was scrolling through my phone, came across your video. And since then, I have been letting everybody know that I am staying in the South. So thank you, thank you. Save me the pain and of, of wasting, <laughs> wasting time up there, try because you just laid it out perfectly. There's, Andrew Yang will probably be the next mayor of New York City. It's that uh, diverse up there, I, I'll use that term. So. Uh, Brother Charles Blow, uh, if you have any closing statements or any final words that you would like to leave us with? I'm, I'm going to leave it there, and, and I'm just going to say, you know, there is tremendous opportunity in the South. It, it is a revolutionary idea, but and therefore there is no revolutionary idea without risk or without resistance. You're not you're going to get that. I'm not suggesting that moving South for Black people will because you can get a black majority that'll create black utopias. It's been the majority black except Hawaii for the last 90 years, but it's not. They still have opioid crisis. They still have income inequality. They still have a, 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 a food deprivation. These are just part of the American system. What I am saying simply is this, that people will do better in the aggregate if they don't suffer under white supremacy than if they do. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying to black people in particular, you will still have some of the same problems because you're human beings and these are human problems. But at least when you have majority of, of states, you have power to deal with the problem rather than begging power to deal with the problem for you. That's right. That's right. So thank you. Thank you, brother, for coming on. I mean, we need this connection. You know, I grew up in the housing projects in New York City, man. I've read several of your New York Times articles and over the years, like I was always one of them brothers that just stayed up on, on politics. Um, thank uh, Sister Cynthia for coming through and co-hosting. Thank you. And Brother Josh, you already know what time it is, BTP. On that, be the power. So um, we leave you with the platform's motto and that is don't just fight the power, become the power. And then and only then will you have the power to make a change. And with that, we say peace. Thank you. All right. Thank you, brother. Thank you. All right. Peace, fam. Check it out. We are going to come back and we are going to continue the discussion. We are going to recap this conversation. We are going to speak about. In brief, Stacey Abrams' is run in Georgia. And we are going to speak about some controversial comments that Yvette Carnell made about the back South strategy. You know, she tried to diss it and basically say that we were cowards because we were trying to run. We're going to address all of that. We're going to shut this live down. Make sure y'all look for the next live. It should be popping up soon. So give me about, about five, 10 minutes, family. Peace.